So friends, I think I have imposed myself on you. No, sir. Because when they were saying ask me about the meeting, then I said that probably it may be eight or ten students, you can come and sit in my hall and we can discuss it, that is more than enough. Because there is nothing much that we have to. So then we started with little about the physiology which I taught to the students and I told them that still I feel guilty about teaching physiology to my students without telling them that what is the Sherrington's opinion about consciousness. <laughs> that I had to go according to the textbook's opinion because you are going to appear for exams and I have to follow the Paula's view about human consciousness. So at least I get this guilt conscious over that I have told you now, uh, I will be telling you now that what is the Sherrington's view and what it means to us. Because this most common thing that we know that we have got abilities to perceive, feel, think, desire, doubt, discriminate, act. And these abilities, because of these abilities, we are able to see the physical world in the waking state, the dream world in the dream state, and then the abilities become dormant with us during the deep sleep state. And these abilities get changed. Whenever there is electrochemical change in the nervous system. So it may be due to the drugs, it may be due to the disease, or it may be due to the drinks, or it may be due to the old age or whatever it is. And that's why we believe that electrochemical activities in the brain are responsible for human thoughts and human consciousness. And this view was further strengthened by Paulo's studies that the brain can be conditioned and this conditioning can be shown experiment which can affect the human behavior. And this change in the human behavior demonstrated by Paulo has convinced practically all of us that the thoughts and consciousness originate from the human brain and there is, we are nothing else but the human body. So this view is so deep rooted in the field of our consciousness that if somebody tells something different than this, we just ignore it. And that is probably the reason why Sherrington's view was ignored by the scientific community. Sherrington, as you know, is supposed to be the father of experimental neurophysiology. And he is a Nobel laureate for his studies in physiology. But the view which he has put for human consciousness. He said that the physicochemical or the electrochemical activities in the brain provide only material for our thinking to act. And we are aloof from the body. And this view was highly criticized by Paula that it is a metaphysical view. And it's, that's why the scientific community has never entered this view even in the textbooks. And to me it appears 
that the scientific community is probably committing the same mistake which was committed by the Catholic Church when it refused to accept Galileo's watch. And now the scientific community is not able to understand it because as it is told in our Vedic philosophy also that you require to know human life from two angles, the metaphysical angle and the physiological angle. They say that way with the way it away it is it is Brahma with Odin. That those who realize the reality tell you that you understand both the metaphysical view and the physiological view. And that's why I thought that the view which I believe which sharing is the probably the thing which I should tell to my students. But I could not because I had to restrict myself to what is written in the textbooks of physiology and what students are supposed to answer in the examination. <coughs> so that guilt conscious was there which I expressed to the Vasari and he said that yes, we will like to listen to you and he has arranged this function. So that is the background with which we start. So to understand the Vedic view and the physiological view, we will require to go through first some salient features in physiology and then we will go with what the Vedic view has said about it. If we come to the physiology, you know that as he has said that my first lecture was for the human body, that human body is the product of biological evolution. The evolution that has started with the first DNA molecule with abilities to grow and multiply, store and transfer experiences in the form of nucleotide sequence. And this sequence was then subjected to the process of mutation, <coughs> mutations which were adaptively computable were allowed to survive, others were eliminated, giving rise to different genomes that we see at molecular, cellular and multicellular forms in plant and animal things. And human genome is one such genome which has the history of millions of years of evolution and it is because of these experiences only a single fertilized ovum which is formed by union of male and female gametes under favorable conditions of growth and development in the womb multiplies, remultiplies, arranges itself into the tissues, organs, systems of the miniature human body. It is then delivered out and passes through the stages of infancy, childhood, maturity, old age and death and different. And during maturity it too produces gametes which on fertilization give rise to the new human body and the process repeats from generations after generations. That is all of us are here as a small connecting link between this whole procedure of evolution. And we have got experience of millions of years of evolution to our credit. And this experience is responsible for our presence here and as you know that our presence here indicates that none of our direct ancestors died before procreation and that's why we are here. And in that whole process the nervous system has evolved. 
and nervous system should be looked in that perspective. And when we look at the nervous system, we find that the nervous system is mainly the difference which comes in the higher animals is the brain. The nervous system has started in C. animone as a single cell but has developed in the human being as multimillion cells. And each nerve cell is connected with number of junctional tissues called synapses. Or we say that there are hundred billions of nerve cells connected with each other by hundred trillions of junctional tissue. And because of these connections, each nerve cell has got the ability, number of computational ability. It can do additions, subtractions, deletions, temporal and spatial summations or the conditions like integration or amplification, stabilization, memory formation, all these are inside the nervous system during the process of evolution and nervous system is a highly evolved mega computer by the nature with human being as a robo in this mega computer system. And to identify ourselves with that robo is the greatest mistake that we can commit. And that we can commit only because we go on whatever the evidence is presented to us by the physiology textbooks. The physiology textbooks tell us that this mega computer is connected or its input terminals are the receptors. Receptors detect the changes in and around the body. They convert it into electrical signal send it to the analyzer which is kept well protected in the cranial cavity and vertebral column and cushion with the fluid material. And when the information comes to this computer then there is information is transferred from one microprocessor unit to the other microprocessor unit. That is, each nerve cell with its synaptic terminals is acting as a microprocessor unit. And this information, when it is processed, the result which comes is then displayed by the effector organs. And this result depends on various memory patterns which are available for analysis. In lower animals till reptilian stage, there was only the segmental portion available, where there were no free microprocessor units available. And there was no possibility of learning from the experience. Whatever the nature is given, it has to accept. But as the evolution progressed to the birds and mammals, additional information or free processor units were added and that's why when the response was given it was analyzed by the two centers which we now call by the term the reward and punishment center. The reward center detects whether the useful purpose is served or not. If it is served, it stops the further activity in the nervous system. If it is not served, then the punishment center detects it and it starts using the free microprocessor units to superimpose on the genetically built memory circuit some new circuit. And in that process, if some new circuit is found and it is detected by reward center,